Welcome everybody to another episode of Lockdown 23 and 1. Today we're going to be traveling down to a North Carolina prison to speak about a female correctional officer that lost her life inside the cell block and the way that she went out is pretty treacherous. But there were some warning signs beforehand and we're going to speak about that and how maybe some of this could have been avoided. So if this is the type of content that you're into, all things lock up and crime related, then this is where you want to be. Hit that like, subscribe, notification bell before you leave and check out my playlist with many more videos for you to start watching today. Now to start this story, it does not begin in the penitentiary. It starts on the streets with a man by the name of Craig Clifford Weesink. Mr. Craig Weesink here happened to try to do a little arm robbery in the trailer park. Got wind that someone had a little bit of reefer with some cash, decided to go to his house with a shotgun with one of his buddies. Upon getting there, they end up kicking the front door in. Mr. Weesink happens to fall through the front door, gets kicked in the head by the owner, pushed out somehow and closes the door behind him. That's when he blasted the shotgun through the front door, shooting the homeowner directly in the chest. His wife comes out to see him bleeding out in the kitchen floor where he eventually loses his life. Now the article said that they kicked in the door. I'm guessing they probably broke the locks. So the homeowner, once he got him out the house, was probably putting pressure up against the door to make sure they don't come back in. And unfortunately, they ended up blasting him. Sad situation, man. My condolences go out to the family of the loved one lost, but... Mr. Weesink happened to dip off, and he was caught about two weeks later in Arizona with his girlfriend. And that testified on numerous things, you know, solidifying pretty much for the jury to find him guilty. For first-degree murder, attempted robbery with a firearm, discharging a firearm into an occupied property, and a misdemeanor larceny of a motor vehicle. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But now that we got a little information on why this guy's in prison, let's speak about how he ended up killing a female CO. Bertie Correctional Institution is comprised of two units housing closed and medium custody offenders. The closed custody unit is a 1,000 single cell unit. And closed custody, for anybody that might not know, is people that possibly might be like PC or extremely dangerous. They'll keep them secluded by their cell. Usually movements with these guys are watched more by the COs. But just like many other prisons, they got multiple level offenders. They got a medium custody unit as well, a 504 bed dormitory style unit. RTCI opened in August 2006. Now coming from this prison, as a matter of fact, recently, as of August 15, 2023, an associate warden pleads guilty in a federal fraud scheme. So, you know, there's dirt taking place in the majority of prisons across the country. I don't think there's any out there, but there's none. If you really do some digging, there's a bunch of news stories on almost every prison out there. So to see corruption in the system, it doesn't really shock me. But to hear about a female CO dying the way that she did in the cell block, that blows my mind. Now this is the Sergeant CO that lost her life, 29 year old Megan Callahan. She grew up in Edenton, a historic town on the banks of the Albemarle Sound about a half hour's drive from Bertie. She loved children, her friends say. She supported the Special Olympics and the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Sad man, it seems like the worst type of things happen to some really good people. Callahan began working at Bertie in 2012, just six years after it opened up, and was promoted to Sergeant four years later. She was always protective about her staff and concerned about their safety, her mother said. As a matter of fact, her mother said that she complained all the time that the prison is completely understaffed. And if you are to ask me, that's probably the main culprit of why she lost her life in this prison. If there was more guards with the proper backup, which we're going to get to in a second, then none of this probably would have happened. Now, on the day of the altercation, Miss Callahan made a phone call about an hour prior. She was worried that officers were not prepared if an inmate attacked. About 250 inmates lived on Callahan's unit. Some were serving time for murder and others were gang members. All had behaved well enough in the prison to be in a medium custody. So that's another major thing. A lot of correctional officers think that lower the custody sometimes is safer. But really, we've broken this down in past videos. The most dangerous prisons, if you were to ask me, are medium. Because you still got all the rapos and you got the killers, but they're able to walk around much more than the higher level closed custody. You know, but people don't really think like that. They think higher means more danger. And really it does, but when it comes down to working in the prison, me personally, you're going to be safer in a Red Onion style prison. You know, where they got to be completely shackled before they even come out the cell. But her unit consisted of a dormitile rather than small cells. And that's just a bunch of bunks in an open room. So, you know, anybody could jump on you at any given time. 
you know, a female CEO, they go in, they're not thinking anything like this would ever happen. But really, the threat is extremely high. You know, if they really wanted to do something to her, there's nothing that she could do. It goes on to say that many of the officers were untrained rookies. And I don't doubt that either. The turnover rate for these employees in prison are crazy. I used to see new CEOs, I'm not even going to exaggerate, literally three, maybe four a week. They would quit almost the first day of walking in there into the population. They knew who was new and they would put the pressure on them. They ain't coming back the next day. Not to mention, you know, a lot of people don't understand as well that these prisons, they're in the middle of nowhere. So people got to drive like an hour and a half, two hours sometimes just to get to work. That's why they'll make it in these small towns usually and everyone in these towns work in the prison. <laughs> it might all be related too. So it's very easy to see how and why, you know, a prison can be understaffed. Not to mention they're not getting paid enough, risking their lives going into them cell blocks. But back to the article, it says late in the afternoon on April 26, routine prison tasks occupied two of Callahan's crew members. One officer was manning the control booth. Another was helping an inmate who worked as a janitor. That left Callahan with just two officers to watch roughly 250 inmates. Of Callahan's two remaining officers, one had been on the job for less than a year. The other officer joined the prison just two months earlier and had not been through the four-week basic training course, officers said. Homeboy ain't even went through basic training. You know he ain't gonna back nothing up. And in this training that the officer hasn't had showed how to subdue an attacking inmate, right? So he doesn't even know the proper procedure to do this. He's just a normal cat coming off the street trying to get a job, probably. Don't care nothing about corrections. He or she, I don't know, man, they're probably terrified. I haven't even gotten to how it went down, man. Y'all are gonna be blown away. This is sad. But now that we know how short-staffed she was, let's speak about Mr. Craig Wiesink again. He was serving a life sentence for first-degree murder like we already spoke about, but he wasn't known as a troublemaker in prison, believe it or not. During his 13 years in prison, Wiesink had been cited for six infractions, records show, which is hardly nothing for 13 years. I'm telling you, I got six almost within the first month. They included disobeying an order, interfering with staff and substance possession. Weesink's relatively good behavior gained him a spot in Bertie's upper tan unit. But keep in mind, even though this guy's doing good in prison, he's still a killer in there for life without parole, but somehow made his way to the upper tan unit, where the dorm's common area with tables, TVs, and a microwave was flanked by rows of bunk beds. Inmates there are free to move about in the dorm. About 5.35 p.m., about an hour after Callahan had that conversation with the other officer about short staff. Crazy, huh? Just an hour later. Weesink set a fire in the dorm trash can. Then he walked across the room and waited. Callahan was wrapping up her 12-hour shift when she took those two officers to respond to the incident. Upon arrival, about 60 inmates congregated nearby. Here's what happened, according to documents from the medical examiner. Callahan ran from her office to the control room to grab a fire extinguisher. She doesn't run to the booth, try to get all the inmates to get on their bunk and then wait for the fire squad. No, she tries to put out the flames herself with two other correctional officers. One that's been there for less than a year and the other one that ain't even went through basic training. She's the sergeant, so she's got to step up. One of the two officers who responded with Callahan went into the dorm but stopped. She stood in the doorway as Callahan rushed to the fire. Oh man, it was another female. She seen that stuff going on and said, fuck no, and I don't blame her. All of them should have pumped them damn brakes. But Callahan unfortunately went into the dorm, grabbed a 50 gallon trash can and put it into the shower area. Then Wasinski tacked her from behind. When Callahan tried to run from him, he threw boiling hot water from the microwave on her face. Told a story about that in prison before as well, man, treacherous stuff. He boiled that hot water probably right before she came in, running for her life. Then she's blinded. That ended up stopping Callahan in her tracks. Wasinski tried to cut her with a piece of glass. Then he grabbed the fire extinguisher, stood over Callahan, and repeatedly beat her in the head until she was dead. As the alarm sounded across the prison, six officers armed with metal batons rushed into Upper Tan. We sink backpedaled and sprayed a wave of white fire retardant before dropping the canister. Keep in mind, that was the same extinguisher he just beat that girl to death with. He's fighting other CEOs off by spraying them with it. This is something that would scar people for the rest of their life in that cell block they seen. He then pulls out a shank and puts it to his own throat when an officer shot pepper spray into his face. Weesink sobbed as he let the officers handcuff him. 
Others tended to Callahan. About 25 to 30 officers responded to the attack. This was the sergeant that she was talking to on the phone about an hour prior to the incident. He says he wanted to respond to the alarm, but the policy doesn't allow sergeants to leave their units. Sergeant Garganus, a former Marine who served two tours overseas, was standing at the bottom of the tan unit stairs. When officers carried Callahan down on a backboard, he helped lift her onto a stretcher. Seeing her, he said, brought flashbacks of things I had seen in Iraq. Callahan died around 6.20 p.m., less than an hour after the attack. Mm-mm-mm. Crazy, crazy situation that a lot of y'all probably never even heard of. And that's why I do these things, man, to show y'all a different light, different view of the penitentiary. But this was like some Final Destination stuff. When she called the guy and talked about being understaffed right before the incident, it's just unreal. And the fact that this guy killed her, you know, and he didn't have hardly any kind of issues in prison for 13 years, it just blows my mind. So let this unfortunately be a rude awakening for anybody that wants to choose this career path. You could be found in a corner slumped up with 150 stab wounds. It can happen to you. Always tell yourself that before you go into work. And let that help you make decisions when you see something like this happening, man. A, a damn dorm on fire and there's only two people there with you that ain't even trained. That would have been a perfect time to show these trainees when not to go in. You know, but it is what it is. She was just doing her job. Probably wasn't thinking about all the repercussions that could come from it. But that's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. Got a little something from it. In the meantime, though, stay tuned. I got a crazy Christmas story that's going to blow your mind. It is pretty graphic. I'm going to have to tweak it a bit to get it closer to family friendly. Anyway, stay tuned for that, ladies and gentlemen. It is the holiday, so it's going to fit right in. As always, though, until the next time, y'all be easy, be safe, and stay free.